Um, I should probably introduce myself first. So um, I'm Laurie Bassam. Um, I was and am assistant curator for the Plastic Remaking Our World exhibition. So the exhibition you saw this morning, um, me and a team of five other curators um, curated that exhibition over two years. So this um, sort of conference feels like a great... <laughs> I don't know, accompanying piece to the exhibition. Um, it expands on things that we thought about, things we didn't get time to include. So it's been really wonderful listening to all the speakers today and just reflecting on the kind of the various kind of problems that colonialism poses for plastics across design histories um, and sort of in environmentalism currently and now. Um, yeah, so I'm running this last session. There'll be um, me and Nanjala will have a sort of conversation. And then um, Heather and Sarah, whose works in the exhibition, will also then have a conversation as well. And then we'll end with Compound 13, whose work also features in the exhibition. So this is sort of the context and why we're in V&A Dundee, this last section. Um, I really wanted to just say thank you so much to Nanjala for making your way up to Dundee. I know <laughs> you've had a hectic travel schedule, so we really appreciate this. Um, um, Nanjala sort of uh, contributed a really amazing portion to the plastics um, catalogue. So Nanjala is a writer and journalist um, from Kenya um, who extensively writes about um, society and politics, particularly with the African and Kenyan context. Um, and her, her section in the book, Homo Plast um, Plasticus, uh, <laughs> always a bit of a tongue twister, really deals with um, contextualising the plastic problem within a Kenyan context. So um, we'll sort of chat about that briefly, and then um, Heather and um, Sarah will discuss Sarah's work, which features in the exhibition. So, um, yeah, un Undergarments, as well as Untitled Crocodile, are both really important pieces that we're really pleased to include as part of the exhibition. Um, and yeah, we're just really pleased you've all made it here today. So thanks so much again to everyone for coming. Um, and then, obviously, Compound 13... Um, is another video piece that we'll be seeing, which actually, again, does feature in the exhibition. And that um, project is sort of a combination research project, but also on the ground um, in Daravi itself. So it's a really interesting project which looks at kind of Daravi and um, Compound 13 as this kind of epicentre for um, the informal plastics um, recycling that goes on in um, Mumbai and India. Um, and I won't spoil too much by sort of describing it in great detail. The video does a really great job of looking at that informal economy. So, um, yeah, I hope you enjoy that as well. But um, for now, I'm just going to kind of have a chat with Nanjala and you'll sort of um, see me pull through sort of some of the ideas that feature in the, in the book, just so you get a taste of what we talked about when we were writing the plastics catalogue. Um, and, yeah, if you have questions, we can come up and do those as well. All right, thanks so much. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> it is slightly under spotlight, I definitely see. Like, yeah, it's like looking out onto um, a big audience. Can see me. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose I wanted to sort of focus on the article from the book just mm. because obviously it really relates to the work we've done here. Um, but also, yeah, your kind of experiences of plastics in Kenya itself. Um, so I guess your piece in the, in the sort of publication starts with um, the change of use in plastics within your lifetime and how you've seen it come and sort of morph and grow between sort of, you say, 1995 and 2005, this huge kind of upsurge of plastic usage. And I wanted you to sort of explain and explore that and how you felt, um, whether that has legacies in colonialism, whether it's kind of part of a network and ch changing economy in Kenya. Um, yeah, I guess your thoughts on that to begin with. Sure. Um, I think when you are part of a former colony, it's also it's it's all too easy to kind of think about colonization in relation to the former um, direct imperial power, but I think it's very important as we're thinking about colonization and power and power disparities to also really think about contemporary imperialism that there are still very many shades of imperialism that are underway in the world today that might not flow in the same directions that we're accustomed to, but have um, similar uh, rhythms to what we saw in the past. So when we think about plastics and imperialism, there is, I think, what has happened in the exhibitions, that mapping that goes to traditional um, routes through which uh, goods, uh, services, people, you know, circulated. But then there's also this modern imperialism of uh, shifting patterns of being, of shifting patterns of community, of kind of outside economic primarily, but also social and political uh, forces reshaping, you know, social, political, economic organizations in less 
in less powerful countries for the economic benefit of the metropole. And that really is the, if you were to break it down to its simplest form, it's the use of force to reorganize um, this society for the economic benefit of this society. And so when we think about contemporary imperialism, we also have to think about um, multinational corporations. You know, the fact that um, I do a lot of work in very rural, uh, remote places, and I, I, I used to live in Madagascar, and, you know, there are places in Madagascar where you cannot find um, clean water, you cannot find... Um, uh, you know, a supermarket, a shop, forget a supermarket, a little kiosk, but you will find a Coca-Cola. You will find a Coca-Cola bottle. And so I remember we were going to rural Madagascar to do um, some work for this. I used to work in uh, development and um, I was being told if you get food poisoning or if you get anything that kind of messes up your insides and you can't find drinking water, what they tend to do is to prescribe is you take a bottle of Coke and you put a tablespoon of salt in it and you drink that as oral rehydration salts because you're going to find a Coca-Cola somewhere in there. And I found that to be really interesting as a really um, how we've disrupted, you know, water should be one of those fundamental things that everybody who wants it should have access to clean water. So um, it's really to reframe the way our idea of origins, directionality, and thinking about imperialism. I think that's like a foregrounding thought. Um, to go back to your question, you know, um, the, it, it is partly the economic disruptions of uh, structural adjustments, sort of the late 70s, 1980s, leading to the collapse of the economy in the 90s. But also, you know, we have to also take responsibility for the domestic transformations. We lived under an authoritarian regime for... Um, 40 years, for the better part of 40 years, and then sort of the 1990s kind of being this crucible of, of change and collapse and all of those things. Um, before structural adjustment, for example, you know, public schools were fully subsidized by the government, public health was fully uh, subsidized by the government, people were able to, there was still this very, um, very simple idea, but really fundamental idea of social mobility, that you could actually uh, go from a primarily rural existence to a primarily urban existence. Oh, hang on. I wonder if we'd get one of those. <laughs> I wanted to it's get a bookmark. <laughs> um, but... Um, so structural adjustment is an imperial act. And for those of you who are not aware, structural adjustment basically um, towards the end of the 1980s, after the collapse, the oil shocks of the 1970s, you know, everybody's very happy in the 60s. Oil prices are high. We're all expanding. We learned about Hong Kong trade expansion. And then the 1970s, um, uh, the oil shocks, because of the, the way that the oil prices behave, a lot of com countries that were dependent on oil for their exports suddenly lost a big chunk of their budgets didn't have money to spend on a number of things. And so a lot of economies were in trouble. And the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, um, prescribed a set of policies to help balance the books. And they basically went around a lot of poor countries, primarily in Africa, and, but also in Latin America, telling them that you have to stop funding healthcare, you have to stop funding education, you have to stop funding um, all of these public services because the private sector will take care of it. Meanwhile, take that money and use it to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. The net outcome of structural adjustment is that it eviscerated the middle class in a lot of the developing world, and Kenya was no exception. Suddenly, teachers, lawyers, engineers, doctors, all of these people who had been in middle class professions, they couldn't make ends meet. They couldn't live the lifestyle that they had become accustomed to, but they couldn't go back to work the land because they had already undergone this personal sort of transformation. It's very difficult to go from being, you know, a teacher, a doctor, a nurse, whatever, and then, okay, now you're going to go and be a farmer again, and you're going to do subsistence farming as well. So um, one of the net, in, net outcomes of this economic transformation, this retreat in public services, 
um, is really the transformation of the microeconomy, how people are able to purchase of things. So you're not able to buy sugar in the big two kilogram packet. You now need it in a smaller packet. So that this is what we call the Kadogo economy in Kenya, which is literally the translation is small, that people are now buying things in small quantities in order to maintain some kind of aspect of their previous life. And this is where plastic comes in because the person who is the big trader is dealing in the big 200 kg uh, packets, but is dispensing it in smaller, mm -hmm. smaller, smaller quantities. Um, and what I, the thing is, I couldn't tell you exactly the moment that sort of plastic became common in Kenya. So this is what I say in, in the essay. I, when I say now I use my age as a metric, I realize I'm not so young anymore. Um, but um, I'm a child of the 80s. And all the way through primary school, going to the store meant taking a woven basket and going to the store and getting a number of things and carrying the basket home. And there was a space in the entryway for the shopping basket. And then when I was in high school, suddenly going to the store meant going and getting a plastic bag from the supermarket and getting a plastic bag from the store. And suddenly there wasn't a shopping basket anymore. Mm -hmm. There wasn't that kind of uh, place for the shopping basket. There suddenly was under the sink this massive collection of bags that had only been used once or twice before. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with, with water. It, we went from, you know, uh, the quality of water deteriorated so fast in Nairobi. It went from very reliable municipal water to you absolutely cannot drink the tap water. Mm -hmm. And you had to then wh what would you do if you needed water and you were in town and you had to buy the single use mm -hmm. plastic bottle. And it went from, I think I must have already been in double digits the first time I used a single use plastic bottle. I was already pretty much, um, in high school, mm -hmm. when the first time I used a single-use plastic bottle, it wasn't the thing that people did. Now, everybody is using single-use plastic bottles, and it happened very quickly. It was a very short period of time, probably a decade and a half, two decades. And I think now it's become so normalized, but it really starts off from the, the services that people had become dependent on to sustain their middle-class lives. Um, being taken out from underneath them. And I think it's really interesting in the in the piece as well that you talk about how at the same time of the collapse of municipal services, there's also this sort of um, economy based on tourism and the mm -hmm. idea that then you're promoting the use of a plastic bottle and w mm -hmm. safe water drinking because of that tourism, because of that incoming sort of uh, Western gaze and, and mm -hmm. what we deem the kind of sanitised. So it's yeah. like it's these two things kind of happening at once is increasing the use of plastics yeah. um, exponentially in a, a really yeah. short period of time. Very, very short period of time. And I also, this is the other thing I like, I, I, I sort of, thought about when I was writing the essay. You know, I grew up in the city. Mm -hmm. I grew up literally seven kilometers from downtown Nairobi in uh, what you would call row houses, I think, here. And we didn't have running water for 11 years. Mm -hmm. Most of my childhood, we just didn't have running water. And so if you wanted to drink water, you either had to boil it and you had to treat it and then, you know, whatever, or you had to buy the single-use plastic. And it's this confluence of both well, whose idea was it to start putting what in the bottle? Mm. And the interesting thing is actually the Coca-Cola company wasn't the first. We have a huge Coca-Cola um, distribution manufacturing plant in Kenya. The Coca-Cola company wasn't the first company to do single-use plastic in Kenya. It was a company that is owned by a former president or a relative of the former president. And so there's a nexus there also between um, who performs the gaze for whom, mm -hmm. right? The initial target market for single-use plastic in Kenya was not Kenyan people. It was the hotels. It was the, you know, the tourists who were coming in and, and sort of going to on safari, especially for going on safari and things like that. And then it just became the secondary market. Suddenly, because of all of these other things, mm -hmm. there's now a secondary demand that also drives that economy. I think it's really interesting hearing Nina speak as well about this idea of um, waste happens elsewhere mm -hmm. and that on safari it's in this nice sanitised bottle but on the sort of downtown streets of Nairobi it's, it's in piles, it's, you know, it's... Well, it's both yeah. and this is one of the things that's actually happened um, and I guess we'll talk about this later but as of 
three years ago and now, um, single-use plastic is banned in all the national parks mm -hmm. in Kenya because it had become such a huge problem. Mm -hmm. It had become... Um, and this is... It's a question of how people perceive the natural environment elsewhere. So when tourists come to Kenya, the way that the, the whole construct is packaged is you don't have to interact with locals. Come and look at a lion, come and look at an elephant, take your pretty pictures and then leave. Kenya is a backdrop for your adventure and not a place where human beings live. Mm -hmm. And so the whole construct is basically that there's no accountability. Sure. There's no responsibility for what you do. You see these images, I mean, you know, my government will probably take my passport for me saying this, but you see these images of people in their land cruisers. In There's no need for the khaki people. You're not doing anything. You're sitting in a car. There's nothing that you're doing. <laughs> you know, and the khaki and the boots and the hat. And, the, and you're in an air-conditioned car. Come on. Um, but you see people in these land cruisers, you know, 18 land cruisers, chasing after a lion across the savannah so that people can go and take pictures of it. And then you drink the water and you toss it out of the land cruiser. Mm -hmm. And it had gotten to the point where, especially in the Maasai Mara, it was out of control. There was so much plastic um, everywhere. And of course, that's not coming from us because we don't go on safari, yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, it's, again, that's changing. That's an oversimplification. But, um, but the underlying thing is when you travel and not just to, to, to Kenya, but really when people travel, there's a more abstract sense of responsibility for the natural environment. Yeah. And so you, you don't necessarily see what that plastic bottle is going to look like five years from mm -hmm. now, 10 years from now. When you're in the hotel and you're going through your plastic bottles, you know, I must drink, um, you know, my plastic, my fresh water, you know, three bottles a day, you don't see where those bottles end up, you know, and you don't have to live with the choking rivers and the, the mounds of garbage and all of that stuff. And so there is that disconnect that is engendered by the whole construct of how travel in, particularly in Africa, mm -hmm. is packaged and sold to Western um, consumers. And, and plastic kind of cleaves to a lot of these mm -hmm. Um, discrepancies, if you will. Yeah, it's sort of, um, yeah, it's, you don't think about it, it's over there. It's mm -hmm. done, you've done your moment with it and you're gone again. Yeah. Um, something else that really struck me in the piece that you wrote was um, you talk about sort of the lens of British colonisation through the body mm -hmm. and particularly around sort of menstruation and periods. Um, I wondered if you wanted to talk a bit about that, how it's kind of um, sort of British imperialism kind of shapes sort of attitudes and norms as well as kind of how you deal with your body yeah. um, sort of as a person who bleeds. Yeah. So this is very interesting. When they invited me to write this essay, the, the basis for this essay was a, couple, a year or two before I had gone to Madagascar and gone back to Madagascar, I should say, and I had written another essay about plastic. And it had been commissioned as a sort of a gentle piece, if you will, on a group of students who was doing a recycling project in Madagascar. But because I had lived in Madagascar and I had really been shocked by the state of sort of plastic waste, in the back of my mind, I had always assumed that Madagascar was producing an excess amount mm -hmm. of plastic. And then the research kind of sh tells a slightly different story, which is in the essay, well, no spoilers. <laughs> um, but then when, th when I was asked to write this essay, I, asked, I was like, what did I not do in the other essay that I really want to make explicit? Mm -hmm. And the challenge that I set for myself is I wanted to write a feminist assessment of the plastic problem. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be explicitly feminist because the other one was feminist in that all the lead voices, most of the lead voices in the essay were women and I had sought them out specifically because I wanted to, t I like to tell women's stories. But this one I really said to myself, I, I want to do it in a way that makes people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing we're having these conversations is that we tend to make the bo women's bodies abstract and the things that women's bodies do, or the people who menstruate that they, we do and we experience, because there's this element of shame and this element of, well, that's private and that doesn't need to be discussed and whatever. And so I went for the thing that makes people most uncomfortable, which is menstruation. And to really, really illuminate the idea of plastic as a paradox. Mm -hmm. Because 
menstruation is kind of, um, it's one of those things that, well, I want to say everybody, but everybody's a big word. Most people should know happens. <laughs> and the reason I say that, I've been watching this thing, this is a sidebar, I've been watching this thing on Instagram where she goes up to men and she asks them questions about periods. And honestly, really, <laughs> it's, wow. <laughs> um, but so the, reason, the thing is, I really wanted to, to go into this because I think if we are going to unravel the paradox of plastic, mm -hmm. we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. There is a discomfort that's going to have to come by the fact that all of us, every single one of us, it's become so intertwined with our lived experiences that it is impossible for anybody to take a, an attitude of moral superiority. Mm -hmm. It is when people talk about vegan plastic, a vegan leather, vegan leather is plastic. So then you have to think about, well, what is the moral calculus that you've done yeah. that says vegan leather is, is a morally superior product to cow leather, which is organic, biodegradable, and we're making use of the whole animal. You know, there's a whole calculus sure. there. So that's why I wanted to write about this. The whole idea of secrecy and shame around the female body is in, in Africa and in a lot of, um, you know, in former British colonies, I should say, is very much rooted in these attitudes towards female sexuality. Mm -hmm. That the female body is something that to be, to be hidden, it's something fragile to be shielded from the public gaze is, is very much rooted in this Victorian Puritanism. Mm -hmm. Because I speak to elders, I speak to, you know, now there are few and few of them. You speak to elders and there's a slightly different approach to it. Everybody of a certain age, if I speak to my grandfather, he's now deceased about periods, he's like, yeah, women bleed. <laughs> you know, people who have uteruses, they bleed, and that is life. But if you speak to people who would be of my, my father's generation, mm. that's not something that we speak of. Mm -hmm. So I ask myself, well, what is this transformation? What is this generational shift that happens that is our reorientation towards the female body, towards the body in general? And what I think a lot of people who live in the West take for granted is that colonization was not just about the violence and the force, even though the violence and the force was a big part of it. It goes back to what I said in the beginning. It's about the fundamental reorganization of a social and political order for the economic benefit of another. Mm -hmm. So the violence is a means to an end. It's a big part of it, but it's also a means to an end. And the idea of creating a pool of labor, a reliable pool of labor that could be called upon in order to produce the raw materials that were needed for industry. Well, how do I break these people? How do I get these people to become a pliable, ready source of labor? It starts with the breakdown of the psyche. Uh, uh, Steve Biko, who, is a South, who was a South African freedom fighter, he said, you know, in the end, the most powerful tool in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed, mm -hmm. is to shift that belief system whereby um, instead of occupying your, your situation with you know, pride and with self-awareness, there is a shame attached to it. So forcing, um, you know, what I tried to get at at the essay is that there was an element of shame that was introduced to the way in which our societies were restructured that I think feeds into this idea that not only do we, um, we don't even acknowledge, you know, this very basic biological functions. Yeah. We don't even, it's not even so much that we don't know what to do, it's that now we don't even acknowledge it. And I'll, I'll give you a long-winded answer, but I wanted to <laughs> end with an example. A couple of days ago, uh, weeks ago now, there was a Kenyan lady who tweeted something and she said, um, I find it so heartbreaking that when we talk about, when we go to um, schools to give, rural schools to give girls period products, we give them reusable products and not single use products. Mm -hmm. I looked at it and I thought, why is that shame? Why should girls be ashamed? Mm. Why, is that, why, is, why is that a shameful thing? And the subsequent conversation was basically that having to deal with menstruation, having to think about it, having to talk about it, having to be in a body that bleeds is itself shameful. shameful. Mm. 
And I think that is something that needs to, needed to be interrogated a little mm. bit. And that's what I try to do in the essays. Like, well, where does this thinking come from? Mm. And, what, and then what does it do? It's also really interesting, I guess, in thinking about, um, if you're talking about workforces and an imperial mindset, the idea that single-use products are there to essentially aid you working const mm -hmm. constantly rather than this idea of a slower kind of more um, regimented pace to a month or a yeah. cycle. So it has a kind of double-edged element yeah. to it in that way. But um, yeah, I thought it was a really interesting and powerful way of kind of exploring the microcosms of plastics and how we don't think about them in that context, but actually they have this kind of imperial they do. root. Yeah. And, and the other thing, and, and I really, really want to emphasize this, it wasn't like a blanket condemnation of the plastic products. What I really am leaning into is this idea of paradox, mm -hmm. is this idea of, um, when I was in school, I don't know about, um, you know, other women in this room, but we used to hide our pads in the sleeves. Girl, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> when you had to go, you had to hide it in the sleeve. I went to an all-girls school. Yeah. Who am I hiding it from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there were literally two men on our campus, the security guards, they were at the gate. So why was this and this <laughs> and this necessary? And it's really, really unpacking that. I really wanted to, to think about that. But at the same time, you think about the menstrual huts in Nepal that are still a feature of rural life in Nepal, whereby uh, women, young girls, when they are on their menses, they have to be separated from their community and they, they go to these huts and sometimes they're not heated and it's very cold and people have died. Young girls have died because Nepal is, you know, Himalayas, all these mountain ranges, it's very, very cold. And so I really also then want to not sort of idealize and romanticize the fact that m menstrual hygiene products have really improved the quality of life for a lot of people. But here's an uncomfortable statistic. If you are in your 40s, assume that you had your first menses when you were 12, 13, the very first pad that you used is still in a landfill. Anybody who's ever used a, a, a non-cotton pad, so anything that is not 100% cotton, the very first one that you used is still in landfill. And so if you, if you extrapolate that and you think about what that could mean if, let's assume for the sake of statistics, 50% um, of the world's population, we're told we're 8 billion, 4 billion people, 12 to 14 times a year, assume, you know, seven is probably very generous, but let's average it out and say seven per cycle. We're not gonna make it <laughs> as a world with that amount of plastic. So it's to, well, what is the construct that necessitates the, pla I think if we're gonna get to the solution, we have to then go, what is the construct that necessitates the plastic? What is the hygiene context that makes the plastic necessary? What is the shame context that makes the plastic necessary? What is the fact that, you know, when you tell people about reusable products, there is disgust. What is that disgust and what does it say about our relation to the, fe the body that is gendered female? And, and sort of, I think if we are gonna get to the heart of untangling this paradox, we have to also do that contextual work and figure out what to keep and what to, to let go of. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great way to end. In, and, and it sort of echoes what you've said in the, in the book, which is that it's, it, we need to connect those hard actions with consequences mm -hmm. and sort of pull out that nuance and, and the entanglement we've talked a lot about yeah. today. Um, I'm going to wrap up, I think, and then um, we can pass over to Heather and um, Sarah. But thank you so much, Dajala, for making your way over here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, it's really fabulous to be back up here, <laughs> um, but uh, but not to talk about myself or my own <gasps> thinking, but to talk about um, your beautiful work. So I thought we would just start off by um, by giving a sense of could you get kind of introduce us to this work and maybe a little bit in terms of your larger practice or how you came to it. Yeah. So um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, but I do work a lot sculpturally. Um, and I was, I have two works in the two works in the exhibition. One of them is um, the large hanging sculpture in the foyer space. So if you missed it, <laughs> take a look on your way out. And the other one is in the plastic lab. Um, that was 
This is the one that's pictured on the um, screen, so hopefully you had a chance to see it earlier today, but it's titled Undergarments. It was a commission by VNA Dundee to make a materials library uh, out of recycled um, plastics. Uh, it needed to be um, interactive, it needed to be um, accessible to all ages, um, and what else was other things? There was, there was quite a brief. Um, what else? Oh, and yeah, uh, there was probably some other things, but I'll come to them. Um, but I decided as an artist um, and to maybe uh, choose a different format for a materials library um, to choose the garment. Um, I decided to... Uh, each garment is a different type of plastic, and within each garment it is made reconfigured um, plastics of that type. So, for example, the um, more purpley ob object that's hanging over the railing is kind of like trousers. Uh, it includes a paddling pool, um, a PVC roofing, and uh, some tubing that is reconfigured to make that garment. And each of the garments uh, also have next to them a sort of extended or expanded care label, which includes the qualities of each of the types of plastic, um, how maybe out of my experience best to uh, interact and use the plastic and how to care for it, and also thinking about its lifespan. Um, I I was thinking about how um, it, uh, maybe like plastic um, fabrics or tex petro textile fabrics um, have also always included this care label. Um, it's one form of accountability, but it goes only so far. Um, and yeah, my my sort of whole plan or like hope for the work was really to um, think about the way in which we uh, are often coming in contact with plastics but actually not really thinking about the specificity of it. So like in my work um, I've used, I've mostly worked with HDPE plastic um, but outside of that each plastic has its own quality and I I think because we're so entrenched in this like recycling system, um, certainly in the Western world, um, and ideas of greenwashing, <laughs> that we don't actually hold the objects very often, um, unless we're a part of a production line. So um, I wanted to maybe think about really engaging what that plastic actually was. So like which ones are waxy, which ones are brittle, which ones are, um, yeah, cold, which ones smell a particular way. Like, there's a very fancy machine in, in the exhibition that will, mm -hmm. you can put something underneath it and it will tell you what the plastic is. But um, we've got to be, we've, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's good for us to, like, learn ourselves experientially what, what they are. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's super important, that kind of like chemical literacy and um, and the ways in which like, you know, plastics are so kind of obfuscated, intentionally obfuscated, right, as a way of being able to to kind of push this material onto all of us. Um, but I also wanted to pick up on something that I think is really important um, in your work um, that also um, Angela really brilliantly uh, discussed um, just now, um, which is the relationship of kind of like intimacy and like the choice of using clothes and the choice of using um, undergarments as the, <laughs> as the title. And like, and if you could talk a little bit more about like what what, um, went into that specific artistic decision, and and what are you thinking about when you're making these um, these objects? Yeah. So how did I come to um, a collection of clothes? Anyway, um, I was thinking about how collections of plastics already exist in the in the world, and I was in a charity shop, and I was um, I don't know artistically, I was thinking about how the racks were like these vertical slices, like geologic strata, mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, picture, uh, a, a mess of accumulation of petrochemical time because um, a lot of it's plastic in charity shops these days. Um, and, yeah, I... So that was that was one thing. I wanted a collection that existed already, and the uh, garments. <laughs> so, I guess I yeah, intimacy with the material, the tactility of the material, um, was important to the work and to the commission. Um, I wanted this idea that uh, rather than maybe hanging racks on a store, we had this uh, more playful and participatory and. I guess gestural suggestion of like having taken on the garment or taken it off, and um, so some of them are kind of like the waistcoat, uh, which is second from the right, is kind of slung over the railing. Um, but how far can we take these clothes off? I guess these like plastics, if they've like become part and a part of our bodies. Um, so here we are, here we are, maybe taking one one layer of the plastic off, and are we really bare skinned in our undergarments? Is kind of the the sort of suggestion um, to the work. So yeah, yeah, that's super interesting. Um, I was also wondering if you could talk a little bit more. You've talked a little bit already, but about like what's included in the labels and why you chose to do the labels like that, like in addition to the kind of chemical literacy that you were talking about, what else is, what else do you include in, in the kind of label section of the, of the, of the clothes and, and what is it, what does it have to say to the kind of overall project or the state of our knowledge <laughs> about plastics? Um, I mean, I guess I was picking out something that, yeah, as I said, like a care has, has some kind of accountability of, and, even the idea of a care label, but it's mostly in terms of protecting the consumer object um, against like legal warranties and so on. But um, I included, so I've included a list of qualities with each of those plastics, um, which sort of talks to material, a kind of material library format, but also um, just thinking about garments as something that you know, may be reused or might um, have another life as a different type of object. Um, and thinking about what those qualities of that particular plastic might be in its next permutation or, or reconfiguration as a rag or um, as something that you might create a sling out of or something like this. Um, and what else have I put on it? I've tried to like uh, also include, um, like quite importantly, I haven't transformed the plastics. I've only reconfigured them. Um, so in doing so, I've learned like how to cut things the best way, um, or like uh, how to, yeah, what the sort of limitations of each of those materials are. Um, and so I've included some of that information. I've also tried to include like as much information <laughs> as I could research or find in terms of like what the material actually was. Um, so something like acrylic paint, like house paint is like, I think it's PMMA, <laughs> um, as far as I could trace. I mean, it, all of these uh, materials are just so clouded in like, in inaccessibility of like knowing what their makeup is, um, and and that's part of the one of the reasons why I think it's so important to like learn. And I've learned, I mean, I guess overall the the way in which this that sort of detective work works is that I've really indebted to like other people um, and other, I mean, um, Will and Aaron are in the audience, and I as still life, and they've been incredibly important to me. Um, they live, their studio is like three minutes from mine and um, my house, and uh, we've shared loads of conversations about what this actually, this material that we're actually working with is. Um, and I guess I wanted to communicate that back to the, the wider audience. Like, 
I, I feel like it's quite important not to just be like theoretically connected to plastic, but like actually experientially involved in it to, to some extent. Like I'm not advocating for mass production lines, but um, yeah. Yeah, um, I have so many more questions, but unfortunately we're out of time already. Um, but I encourage you all, in case you haven't had yet a chance to go see it, um, to go interact with it um, when and if you can. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece, and uh, I love the tactility of it. So thank you so much, Sarah. So we're going to show a film that's actually part of the show, um, minus the sound, unfortunately, so that my colleague Ben, who you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, who's in Mumbai at the moment, um, can also speak over the top of it. Um, and this is a film which tells the story of the journey that discarded plastic waste makes through the very intricate and complicated supply chains of the informal recycling industry in, in Mumbai, and Daravi in the centre of Mumbai, where we've been working in collaboration with a whole heap of people who unfortunately can't be with us because it's 11 o'clock at night in India at the moment. Um, um, and, and, and very importantly, the NGO Acorn India um, is one of the epicentres for sorting and, and, and sifting plastic waste. So the film tells the story that the waste makes through, that, through its complicated systems of reclamation and trading and sorting and grinding and reprocessing. And we've just got a kind of a commentary that we're going to put over the top of that, which hopefully um, we, can, we can have a bit of time to talk about at the end. Um, so if you'd like to play the film. So the politics of plastic waste in India and elsewhere is not simply about the management of material and environmental impacts and costs, but it's also about how the brutality of wasted lives play out and the biopolitics of what Henry Giroux calls the biopolitics of disposability. And a lot of this is very, very heavily inflected by caste and class and the particular position of people that do this work in the society where there's a vast amount of surplus labour and a lot of people searching for livelihoods. So these are entanglements of material objects, of extraction, of supply, of materials and the product chains of consumption and discard, which sustain a lot of livelihoods operating right on the peripheries of the formal economy. But they're nonetheless deeply entangled, as we've seen all the way through the day, with the wider systems and infrastructures of extraction and pet plastic consumption and petropolitics and all of that. Um, but what's very important to understand is that what's often or are often just labelled by policymakers in a very simplistic way as parasitical people or parasitical parasites or scavengers um, are actually based on very complicated human human to human infrastructures, person to person networks, and very complicated integrated trading relationships that constitute all the layers of the informal waste management business. And one of the things that our little lab that we have in, in collaboration with a lot of people working in, in and around Daravi is, is, is doing is kind of mapping that out and looking at how that, how that, how that works. Um, because we often think a lot of that is just very much deliberately invisibilized and concealed. It's, it's more convenient to, to invisibilize it. So what um, Jonathan Chapman, the designer and philosopher, describes as urban mining, you can see not just in the extraction of value from the detritus of the consumer society undertaken by the waste workers, but there's also a wider kind of mining of value here from the wasted and used up bodies of the urban poor. Um, and this kind of, it's important to remember there's kind of often a moral kind of, a lot of moral arguments about this kind of work. It's not this kind of exploitation isn't at all limited to waste work. It's all over the informal economy. People earn probably more per day working in this industry than they will in similar industries doing low-level manual labour. Um, and then there's a third point, which is that this kind of work is associated often with what, what is described as wasteland. But one of the big problems for Daravi is that it's actually ab in absolutely prime land, right in the centre of the city and in the crosshairs of the developers. So we see these kind of collisions of infrastructures between the informal self-built um, 
user-generated city, of, 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 of the bottom-up city, and the kind of top-down infrastructural projects like driving metros through, and in the case of Daravi, a wholesale redevelopment plan that's been fought over for the last 30 years. Um, but we would argue that these are kind of human infrastructures of repair and recovery, which keep the urban metabolism moving and stop the city from being basically buried under a mountain of its own waste. Ben. The, um, the, the polished urban imaginary of the world-class future city of which many policymakers speak is an urban imaginary of modernization, of fast connectivities and frictionless trading. This is the so-called world-class infrastructure, which conflicts sharply with the messy, noisy, everyday realities of the informal city of what Raoul Marotta has referred to as the kinetic city, which is where the majority of urban dwellers make their living. One of the things that we've been doing within our research at the lab um, that explores the intersections of these kind of, what, you know, these informal, uh, sorry, these infrastructural uh, collisions is the, is the way that we're mapping out then the complex and intricate supply chains of waste recovery trading from the waste pickers to aggregators sorting through to washing, shredding, grinding that you'll see in this, in this film, all the way to the manufacturing of new products made from um, recycled plastic, plastics. So we're also doing sort of the role of quantification currently of the invisible labor. Um, important to point out that the negative perception and marginalization of informal waste work, driven in particular by the social class caste and or religious affiliations and the widespread stigmatization of those people handling waste materials and human sanitation as well, means that those who are working with waste who are surviving on the, on the very margins of the city are also seen as disposable. So they're disposable people. In addition, there are ongoing associations of purity and impurity in the separation of caste, um, where untouchables have historically performed the unclean and polluting uh, to pass and work, including street, street, uh, street sweepers, garbage removal, and so on, which sadly continues despite the, the concept of, of untouchability having been outlawed by the Indian Constitution back in 1955. So many factors really continue to shape and influence the practice of caste. And as handlers of waste, Dalit and scheduled castes, alongside the Muslim minority in India, are frequently characterized then by their relationship to cleanliness and pollution in popular narratives of morality and value. And so this complex social and economic exclusion then takes place at multiple levels uh, throughout the city throughout society uh, and social and cultural networks, where many people in, in, in waste work in particular uh, are often economic migrants, they're displaced from their villages and they've come to the slums in search of work. Then when they're unable to find jobs, many turn to, to waste work as jobs effectively exist in the bottom of a hierarchy of informal labour, but also ones that have uh, easy access. Great. So there's a few key characteristics of this work that many of you will be familiar. The vast majority of people in, in, in this are, are working at this kind of subsistence level, not what not really able to accumulate anything, but able to earn enough from this kind of work to keep themselves alive and keep their families going. Um, we think it's hard to, hard to know, but we think there's at least mm -hmm. two or 300,000 people engaged in that kind of activity across the greater Mumbai metropolitan region. Um, the waste recycling activities are very much geographically concentrated, particularly the sorting uh, activities that you see here, because the, the supplies get aggregated up through a very complicated chain of trade. Um, scarce capital means that for a lot of people, there's, a, there's an easy entry in terms of just being able to collect, but being able to store or accumulate stuff means you need access to space, warehousing, capital, and that also means you have to have more money. So there's a sort of hierarchy of value that the more the further up the chain you go, the more money you make, uh, and the and the more the, the more easy it is to to kind of sit on materials. One of the things that think speed is essential because value is gained through the the speed at which um, stuff gets processed through the system. Um, not all price, it's largely a cash based economy, but it's also now subject to a much more stricter and much more 
potentially punitive kind of regulatory gaze, and this is to do with the kind of global spotlight being shone on, 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 on plastic race generally. Um, and it also, the, the, the markets for all these different kinds of plastics, and every one of them, every each of these boxes here has a different type of plastic. One will be a PP, one will be HDPE, one will be something else. They all have different spot prices. They move um, in tandem with the um, market for virgin plastic, usually, usually typically at about 50% or 60% cheaper. Um, but it also depends on the volumes that you're able to sell them at. So it is, in a sense, just another commodity market. Um, and there's a whole vernacular language of valuation. Um, and what we argue with as a kind of form of um, knowledge economy and citizen science economy, um, which is highly, highly self-organised and, and, and operates through largely through networks of trust. Ben. Yeah, thank you. The, I think for the majority then of affluent consumers in both the global north and the south, the labour of manufacturing, distribution and disposable is, disposability is, is rendered abstracted and invisible so as to create a kind of seamless experience between the venerated power to purchase and the smooth, those smooth, clean surfaces of the consumer goods that appear as if by magic on our shelves or more recently on our doorsteps. Um, so what you see in the Curtis Combine is, is, is how every consumable object imaginable, all the crap of the world effectively that we are producing, passes through the hands of these, uh, of these waste workers. In a similar but reverse process, but the, the labour of waste recovery then, this disassembly and the recycling, is, is barely acknowledged for, and this is kind of one of our, our sort of key points, really. And so we've mentioned that idea of the politics of invisibilisation and concealment that deliberately hides this labour and the working conditions, which the global supply chain has been discussed today, and the dis and the disassembly uh, chains depend. So the byproducts or the side effects and the consequences of this kind of process of urban modernization are loaded on to the lives and the bodies of the urban poor, sustaining these illusions then of this kind of weightless and seamless economies of how our products just, you know, miraculously uh, appear. Meanwhile, the laboring underclasses form this kind of dark matter, if you like, of the informational economy. Um, providing visible and un unacknowledged infrastructures that hold the city together. And we often, we also see this, you know, appearing in different ways um, uh, with the smart city. Furthermore, then, uh, these workers are slowed down, you know, they're held back, they're constrained by inadequate basic infrastructure of shelter, of water, of sanitation. Just as the lives then of the elites they live uh, side by side with are accelerated by fast digital urbanisms or forms of platform capitalism. So then, crucial to debate around sustainable practices in relation to environmental crises is that the work of informal waste management industry in, in, in India and Dairy particularly is generally absent. Uh, it's critically absent from the official data about the environmental social costs of plastic manufacturing, consumption and disposal, or disposable waste and toxic pollution more, more broadly. So we, what we've found is that the, the work of the informal waste management industry uh, being absent from these uh, official narratives means that in the quantification of how much waste gets uh, handled and disposed of via, via things like um, landfill and the quantification of, of ocean waste are totally out of kilter with the actual extraordinary values uh, and high levels of plastic recycling and waste recycling that happen in India. So it's basically invisible, but it's not recognised by the state. Um, so there's no doubt then that these kind of countless efforts to, to raise the awareness of the problem of waste have not really taken hold amongst uh, sections of the middle class and working class. So which are kind of left with this sort of rather self-consciously virtuous symbolic politics then of pre-sorting waste uh, on doorsteps and encouraging recycling, removing some of these plastics, but not really recognising the work. Great. So these, the, this sort of pre-sorting waste and this sort of middle class environmental activism, cleaning up the beaches, etc., very laudable, but they're often mobilised by politicians to construct moral panics and forms of moral sub subjection, particularly of Muslims in the context of India and also of Dalits and the urban poor, most of whom are the people who are doing this work. So these discourses aren't new. The figure of the downtrodden waste picker living on the margins of society and exoticised and othered is often presented as a counterpoint to the dignified labourer who's employed in a well-regulated, well-remunerated production line or an efficiently run modern factory. 
um, efficient, tidy, productive, compliant. So this, this picture of the decent worker is set against the hordes of disreputable vagrants and outsiders left to scavenge from the scraps of what respectable society leaves behind. So those sort of rhetoric summon up essentially Victorian, colonial, 19th century discourses and contemporary discourses about the deserving and the undeserving poor. And they put a sort of moralising filter over the top of a lot of waste work. Um, so we're trying to think about this in quite a number of ways, both in terms of the disposability of the people, but in terms of the way that people's lives who are tied up with waste and whose livelihoods, many of whom have achieved actually quite sustainable livelihoods in terms of being able to accumulate money, um, etc., um, are tied up with these ideas about disposability and marginality. Uh, ben. Oh, we lost you. We can't hear you. Ben. Another aspect of this work that's not, not necessarily uh, visible is, is the knowledge behind this. So, in Dairy, waste work exceeds normative discourses of, say, circular economy in, in, in both range and, and coverage. The aspirational drivers of circular economies, such as repair, reuse, recycle and remake that advance through ecological and sustainable frameworks for implementation, monitoring and management are not new principles. They are already there in places that might be in a highly sophisticated form, embedded within communities that transfer into generational knowledge between people and things. So rather than this is a this is a this paradigm of circular economy is very well developed rather than the one that, that society would like to sort of impose in urban discourses. In a place like Dairy, the profusion of everyday objects and their social life demonstrates the intersubjectivity of people and things. Everything has use value, everything sustains life, nothing is idle and nothing is wasted. So within these kind of shifting temporalities of the circular economy of the always in use, these cycles of disaggregation and aggregation, this assembly and assembly persistently sustain these complex assemblages of diverse knowledges. And these diverse knowledges are entangled with the material flows of objects, their embodied knowledges that are, you know, within these momentary aggregations in which all forms, uh, all sorts of forms of knowledge are coexisting. So, you know, just to give an example then, in her extensive interviews with Catix, um, that process plastic waste on the outskirts of, of Delhi. Kaveri Gill, um, whose who's amazing work we've drawn on her, and she's been a member of our team, shows how intergenerational knowledge is passed down to a younger generation who enters the trade at an early age. This forms a kind of sensorium of knowledge. As the Catic, one of the Catic plastic uh, waste workers explains, he says, Catic knowledge of plastic and recycle is unsurpassed by smelling it, seeing it, and burning it. We can tell what sort of plastic it is. Others have to check with painstaking methods. Because we have invited this knowledge from childhood, we can tell just from experience what sort of plastic we are dealing with, what processes may be used to recycle it, and we know around 180, 200 uh, items by sight. So what we see then in, in that sort of performativity of, of, the knowledge, of that happy guys you're seeing in the film where at incredible speeds all these items are being separated by, uh, into different polymers is, the, is also an evidence of uh, uh, of what can be uh, is, can almost be kind of disturbing in, in their encyclopedic knowledge of consumer objects and the polymers that they're made of, even though most of the objects that they're being processed that are passing through their hands uh, are far out of reach of the person purchasing power um, of those particular workers involved. Graham, just hand it. I think to we'll we'll button. stop we'll stop at that point. Great. Uh, thank you so much to both of you and Ben, yeah, for <laughs> being there late at night. Yeah, um, thanks, exactly. It must be quite 11pm or something yeah. like that. And, yeah. on base, so thank and, you. and thanks to all of you for sticking with us right till the end. <laughs> um, yeah, and sort of whistling through those last few bits and pieces. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to say something about the day in general, but for me it's been a really interesting process and in thinking about the kind of continuing entanglement of colonialism through plastics now and plastics in the past. Yeah, I think I have to say that this is kind of what I wish for in that uh, the, the last presentation of Compound 13 really brought together so many of the things that we'd been thinking about um, and also the kind of nuances that we'd been um, grappling with as well. Um, and I think uh, my probably the biggest takeaway from the day... Am I really echoing? 
weird, no. Um, it, it is, uh, uh, the, the fact that we've gone through, you know, kind of the, the life cycle of plastics to the very sort of aftermath of plastics, but, and, and all the kind of things that happen in between, but also um, um, <laughs> the, that uh, we really think of, think of plastics as uh, intersectional in the same way that the climate and ecological crisis is. So, you know, we've, we've talked, uh, talked about uh, disability, gender, race, caste, um, and, and from both um, the here and now as well as in the past. So I think um, thank you so much to all our speakers uh, and all of you for sticking around <laughs> this long. It's been a really, really interesting day. And so even when my energy levels were flagging, it was kind of like I, I had, you know, had to stay engaged because I was so interested. Um, so thank you. And, and uh, thanks to the online audience as well.